Hello, hello everyone. I am Alice of KHR Arts and Cloud Orchid Publishing and today we are going to talk about my experiences at ChiCon 8 Worldcon. Now for those of y'all that are wondering, wow, that was quite a mouthful, what exactly is that? So Worldcon is one of the biggest and most important author conventions, and it rotates not just around the US, but also around the world. And this year it happened to be here in Chicago. And because of that, I was able to attend. And this was my first Worldcon that I have ever attended or been a part of. So it was a very exciting experience. Now, given that, there was a ton of preparation that went into this. As I said, this is the biggest and most important author convention. This convention has been going on for several decades and it also hosts the Hugo Awards, which is one of the main author award ceremonies for different magazines, publications, authors, genres, you name it. If it has anything to do with writing and publishing, there are awards at this ceremony for it. Now, I attended Worldcon as both a vendor and a panelist. So that meant at the same time as manning my booth, I also had to go and do panels, and on top of that, because apparently I'm crazy, I did both in-person and virtual panels. So this was a ton to prepare for y'all, on top of it being the longest and largest convention that I have ever been a part of. Now to take a step back, Worldcon was set to have 11,000 participants this year. That means panelists, vendors, volunteers, staff, attendees. And unfortunately, due to the pandemic and due to travel restrictions and due to the fact that unfortunately, this was scheduled the same weekend as Dragon Con in Atlanta, Georgia, only about 3,000 participants were at Worldcon this year. That is a massive drop in participation, which meant that unfortunately there were certain panels that were not quite full. That also meant that there were some tables in the dealer's room that were empty, and that meant there were far fewer attendees participating in the convention. That means sitting in on panels, buying things in the dealer's room, and just being a part of the convention in general. This, of course, didn't really make much difference to me in terms of my experience because I have nothing to compare it to. This was my first Worldcon, so I went in with zero expectations in terms of what the convention was going to be like. However, I did have the expectations in terms of what I prepared in a manner of having inventory and sales based on that over 10k participation. And because there were so many fewer <laughs> participants, that meant that I did not make my sales goal and I had far more inventory than I knew what to do with. Now, this isn't exactly an enormous problem since thankfully books don't exactly go bad. You can have them sit around and use them at the next convention, which is what I intend to do. However, I won't lie, it was pretty disappointing when you're expecting over 10,000 people and only about a third show up. But of that third that showed up, they were extremely active. There were tons of people that came and visited the panels and asked questions and participated. And there were so many people that were wandering around the dealer's room at all hours, checking out the merch, and we did make quite a few sales. It was not all for naught, so it was definitely overall a successful convention. It just wasn't as grand of a success as I had initially hoped for. In order to prepare for this convention, I actually prepared an entire year in advance to Worldcon. And this is kind of required for participating as a vendor for most conventions, is you typically sign up for the convention about anywhere from six months to a year in advance, depending on the convention. Sometimes you sign up even further in the future than that. And you get all of the details covered for paying for your badge, paying for your table fees, reserving your hotel room, paying for that, 
getting all of your finances put together so that when the day comes, you have that budget for food and just everything else that you need, emergencies, whatever. So all of that financial planning went into doing this convention, and that was a lot considering that my finances unfortunately still have not recovered from the pandemic. I am glad that I have an official big people day job, However, unfortunately, it's still an uphill battle. So getting all of those finances together was quite the journey, but I was able to successfully cover everything. So that was a success in preparing for this convention. So thankfully, finances were not something that I needed to stress about. The next thing that I had to prepare for, as I mentioned, was the book inventory. And that meant getting together the finances to one, afford to order any of the book inventory that I needed and then also make sure that it was ordered in a decent amount of time to account for the shipping time. This is especially important in today's world since shipping can basically be Russian roulette. You never know what you're going to get. You could end up getting it shipped to you early. It could take months. And a big part of this is due to all the upheaval with shipping anything in general with the actual physical shipping in itself with the shipping across seas or shipping with trucks just all of that has been getting jammed up repeatedly for the past couple of years as well as with books in particular the cost and availability of paper for printing and being able to actually have the books physically created and in stock has been a major problem that a lot of authors have been facing these past couple years. So having to take all those things into account to make sure that inventory actually arrives in time for the convention is a huge stressor. And thankfully, I was able to budget things out where I was able to order most of my inventory way far in advance so that I didn't have to worry about when exactly it was going to arrive as I have allotted myself several months in advance. Unfortunately, there were a few books that I did have to order rather last minute, not so much last minute, but last minute for my plans. But I was very lucky that they all arrived in time so that I had the time to receive them and do inventory before leaving for the convention. So all was well in that court as well. The next step of preparing was the panels. That's another thing that you have to prepare for with conventions if you are a panelist. You won't be able to sign up for panels a year in advance, but you do have to sign up for them several months in advance. And that all depends on how the particular convention works with when they open up scheduling for panels and applying for panels and when they finalize the schedule. And with Worldcon, all of that was done pretty far in advance. So I knew what I was doing pretty far in advance, which was really nice to be able to plan for that. And that was especially important because I attended with my partner, Neil Litherland, and he was also working as a panelist in addition to manning our booth together. So our booth was split between the two of us with selling my books and selling his books. And both of us were very successful in our sales, which was absolutely wonderful. Neil had about four or five panels. I had 10. <laughs> I absolutely do not recommend having 10 panels to anyone. The reason why I agreed to do such an insane number of panels is that the convention was over the course of five days. Technically, the convention was over the course of six days with the extra day of load in on Wednesday. However, Neil and I were not able to get away from our different jobs in order to be able to do that load in. So we had to do the load in Thursday morning on the first official day of the convention, which was very stressful. And we'll get to that in a minute. But officially, the convention was Thursday through Monday over Labor Day weekend with that Wednesday being the official all-day load-in for vendors. So this was a five to six day convention. Some people even made it as long as a week in that a lot of people also will bookend it where they will stay until the day after the convention as well so that they can have that full day to decompress after the closing ceremonies that usually happen anywhere from three to five o'clock at typical conventions and to be able to go to the last of the after parties and have that good night's sleep before they head back home. 
And that was important for a lot of people that attended this convention because these were people that were not just from Chicago and even people that were not just from the States. These were people that flew in from all over the world. One of the big groups being from Glasgow, which is incredible that this convention not only had a national poll, but it had a global poll. So I had the privilege, y'all, of speaking on panels with people from around the world, as well as having the opportunity to sell my books to people from around the world. And that in itself made this convention so worth participating in. In addition, with budgeting and scheduling and all of that for this convention, because it was a five-day convention, that meant that I had to work my work schedule and my projects around this massive event. Five days is a lot for any event. And so that was a lot of time and effort getting everything prepped for the convention, as well as making sure all of my loose ends were tied up with work and projects and tasks that I needed to complete that were unrelated to the convention, but needed to be completed prior to the convention nonetheless, as well as scheduling and figuring out everything that I needed to do post-convention, including my, as I call it, post-con work, my catch-up work, and then getting back on schedule with my work and my projects and my daily tasks. And all of that in and itself is an enormous task, getting all of those things done and getting all of those things squared away and scheduled. One of the big things with this convention was that because it was held in the Hyatt Regency in the Loop in Chicago, which many people think of as quote unquote downtown Chicago, this is the area of Chicago that most people are familiar with where we have things like the Bean and Grant Park and Millennium Park, which means that it's also the busiest part of the city and the worst for things like navigating and parking which made the day of load-in extremely stressful. And to add to this stress, the Chicago Hyatt Regency is also a union-based hotel, which meant that they had very specific rules about load-in and what we as vendors were allowed and not allowed to do. One of the biggest ones that I am going to complain about was that we were not allowed to load in our own things. Now I will 100% admit I am Captain Control Freak. I do not like people touching my things. I like being in charge of everything. I like being able to know where everything is and know what's happening and be in control of what's happening at all times. And a big part of this with Loden is because there's a lot of moving parts, literally. And it's very easy for things to get broken or damaged or lost. The fact that I had to trust these complete strangers that don't know anything about this convention and don't know anything about books or being an author to literally load all of my belongings onto construction pallets and then use a forklift to move those pallets of my things into the convention hall. And the only thing that we could do was follow them. We were not allowed to touch our own things. And then they had to set our things down at our booth for us made me very upset and added so much to the stress. And y'all, I will 100% admit, I hated every minute of it. It was very upsetting. And I did my best to try and get around this stupid rule by they did say that we were allowed to, as they called it, quote unquote, hand carry in things if we packed things in suitcases, which we did try to do. And they ended up not letting us do that. And so I packed all of my books into suitcases instead of their normal, very safe plastic totes that fit them much better and much safer to avoid damage into suitcases. And then I had to let these randos move my stuff for me anyway, which, yeah, very upsetting. Still salty about it. It is what it is. Squishy agrees. It was very upsetting. <laughs> so, that all being said, thankfully, nothing was damaged and nothing was lost and everything did get to the booth. And I am so grateful that I had Neil with me working this convention alongside me because honestly, there is no way that I would have been able to do this convention by myself. While Neil was following the workers to our booth, I had to then take the Jeep and I had to drive it to the valet parking area where we would be able to store our car at the hotel during the duration of the convention. Now this part was also very stressful because the loading dock 
where we were supposed to load in for the convention was in the third sub-level of Lower Wacker. And I will be honest, y'all, I have lived in Chicago for a very long time, and I never had any idea that there was a third sub-level of Lower Wacker. I had no idea. So finding that was a whole adventure in and of itself, and then figuring out how to get back to the second level of Lower Wacker was another adventure and then on top of that finding where the valet parking station was in Lower Wacker <laughs> was an entire journey but thankfully we did it we made it the car was safely packed away into the hotel by the valet team and all of our things made it safely to our booth and Neil and I were able to start putting our booth together the booth setup was beautiful and thankfully everything with that went smoothly because prior to the convention I did what I do with a lot of the very large conventions is that I do a dry run of load in and set up. This means that I do a practice run of packing the car. Of course when I do a practice run of packing the car that means that all of the things I pack into the car are empty so that I'm not hefting these 50 to 100 pound boxes and bags of books. I'm just hefting in empty bags and empty boxes, or they're stuffed with lightweight things in order to mimic how big they'll be, in order to make sure we know how we're going to pack the car, so that that all goes smoothly. And then I also sometimes will do a practice setup of the booth here at home in order to be able to do setup much faster because I already know where I want everything to go and what I want everything to look like. So doing those things in advance meant that loading up the car and then setting up everything at the actual booth went a lot smoother and faster because we already knew what we needed to do. And of course, I'm always grateful that I always get feedback about my booth, that it's a very beautiful setup, that it draws people in, that people love seeing the way that everything is displayed. And I'm constantly learning from other vendors at the convention, seeing how they do their setups, seeing what ideas I might want to steal, seeing what things I might want to change in order to make setup easier, or maybe to arrange something that's more customer friendly, or maybe it just looks better, whatever have you. I am constantly tweaking and updating the setup in order to give myself and my potential customers the best experience possible. A big part of this push was also that recently Amazon released the capability to have your books available in hardback, which is awesome, y'all. I do have some fans who specifically do say that they prefer hardcover books, and the fact that now I am able to provide that makes me super happy. So that was one of the things off my checklist that I had to make sure was done in, pre in preparation for the convention was not only ordering all of my books in hardcover, but also making sure that they arrived in time and I was able to do pricing and inventory. And our booth looked beautiful with all of the new hardcover books and they received a very warm reception. So I'm really happy with how they turned out. Unfortunately, I was not able to get Geisha hands in hardcover in time for the convention due to the high cost. Geisha hands is one of my higher priced books due to the full spread of color illustrations, which means that of course, getting it in hardcover is also expensive. And that was an expense that I just could not afford for the convention. And that's all part of preparing for a convention is sometimes there are things that you just have to sacrifice in the name of the show must go on. Another big part of the convention preparation is the fact that a big part of my brand is that I dress up in full cosplay every day of the convention. This has been a really big draw for me as it brings people in, people ask me about what I'm wearing, it's easy to see me from across the room, people get excited about it, people enjoy it. So that was another big thing that I, that I had to do in preparation for the convention was planning out five different outfits for the daytime of each day of the convention. And then I had to plan out several party outfits for the evenings of the convention. And these parties are just as important 
as the dealer's hall and the panels in terms of networking and meeting people in your community, meeting potential fans and readers, and of course, networking with people in the industry, which was one of the big things I was looking forward to for this particular convention. I am pleased to say that all of my outfits were a success for the convention. There were only two outfits that I ended up not wearing, and that's simply because I always pack one or two extra outfits just in case I change my mind about what I want to wear that day, or in case some sort of disaster strikes where an outfit doesn't work for some reason, just having a backup. So I'm very pleased that all of my planned outfits worked and everyone enjoyed them, and they were just a huge hit and a huge success at the convention. At the actual convention itself, that was very stressful, very intense, but also very rewarding and very exciting. Each day pretty much played out where Neil and I would wake up in the morning and we would both get ready. And of course, I took far longer to get ready than he did as I had to do full makeup and costuming each day. So during that, he would go downstairs and he would get our morning breakfast for us. And this was kind of the funny part was that it wasn't until the last day of the convention that I realized there was a Starbucks inside of the hotel that we did not have to do Uber Eats every day, which I regret both stress-wise and financially because it was one more thing that I had to worry about. To be fair, the Starbucks in the hotel was not readily apparent. It was kind of in this little like gift shop, I love Chicago sort of area. So it was not obvious from the outside that, hey, this is indeed a Starbucks. So unfortunately we had to deal with the stresses of dealing with Uber Eats for both meals that we had every day. That being breakfast and dinner. We didn't really have an official lunch each day of the convention because we just ate snacks while we were at the booth since we were always either at a panel or we were sitting at the booth, so it wasn't really conducive to being able to go out and get a whole meal, as well as it's really hard to sit and eat an actual meal when you're sitting at your booth because people are coming by and talking to you and you're also saying hello to people and things, so it's just so much easier to forego an official lunch and just eat small snacks throughout the day while you're sitting at the booth. So we did have to coordinate those two meals each day, which was a whole thing, but thankfully it was something that we were able to get taken care of and it wasn't something that we had to go out and about ourselves, which was the trade-off of the stress and effort, I guess. So how this schedule worked was each day after we both got dressed and had our Starbucks, we headed down to our booth in the dealer's room. And each day we had our different schedule of panels for that day. And thankfully we only had overlap with one panel and we were very lucky that we had several friends also attending the convention in different capacities. We had several of our friends manning different booths at the convention, which was so much fun visiting everybody and seeing everybody spread. So we did have some help for that overlap, which we were extremely grateful for. Big shout out to Dara. Thank you so much, dear, for manning our booth for us. It was a super big help. But the gist of it was, um, outside of that one overlap that we had, it was whoever had a panel, the other one would stay behind and man the booth. And when they came back, sometimes we had to do the trade-off of the other one then had to scramble to run off to their panel or to have a bathroom break or just have a lap around the dealer's hall to just get up and stretch and be able to do something else for a couple minutes. There was a lot of this back and forth, but there was also a good amount of time that we were sitting at the booth together, enjoying each other's company, and just being a part of the convention, which was really awesome. And people will probably be surprised to hear that you can actually do a good amount of networking, even working as a vendor in the dealer's hall. And a big part of that is because the people come to you which is really nice. You don't have to put forth the effort. They come to you, they come to your booth and talk to you. And there were actually other people that I did networking with while working my booth. They came and approached the booth to check out my books, check out my costume and all that. And I ended up talking to some librarians, some editors, some other authors, and even a literary agent. So never discount the networking that you can do while working your booth.
Hello. Hello. Can Hello. You Excellent. I just introduced myself, so now we have more speakers. I would love for you to introduce yourselves now that tech is going. Lauren, do you want to go first? Absolutely. Hello, everyone. I am Lauren A.R. Masterson, a.k.a. Alice Liddell. This is my first Worldcon, and I am so excited to be here with y'all and celebrate One anime and things that I wanted to talk about, which I think, you know, the um, time period of when the films were released isn't you know, necessarily very close to the 1950s, but a lot of times the time period that's portrayed in a lot of the movies is close to that is in um, Miyazaki's films. And, um, you know, with the war being a big central theme in a lot of those movies, but in terms of um, feminism and exploring the idea of hyper femininity and the rejection of femininity in that, I think that those films do a really good job of exploring that, such as, for instance, in Kiki's Delivery Service, you have the traditional role of the woman that takes on Kiki, that Kiki is living there with her. I mean, she's this very motherly figure. She's baking bread. She has a husband. She has children and in a very traditional style role. And, you know, that scene is just as good and expected as the um, girl in the woods who sits on the roof mm -hmm. and draws and, you know, talks to birds that, you know, she's, you know, not hyper feminine, that she's very tomboyish and she's, you know, all about adventure and exploring and just doing things that are just very, not what you think about when you think about like, oh, a proper lady or, you know, anything like that. And just that both of these people exist in the same film and they're both treated with the same amount of respect and the same amount of, you know, oh, what a wonderful, delightful person that has wonderful wisdom to share for our main character and help them along on their journey. That neither is seen as better or worse or like one is a lesson and this is what's good or this is what's bad. And I just love that that's explored a lot in the different films that it's there are different flavors of what it means to be feminine or to be a woman or just to explore different expressions of gender in, ge in general. All right, uh, welcome everyone to the Biology of Fantasy Creatures panel. Absolutely, thank you so much. Hello everyone, I am Lauren A.R. Masterson, AKA Alice Liddell. I am currently at Con. please excuse my messy <laughs> hotel room. Um, I've been vending in the dealer's hall, it's been a fabulous time. And um, I personally have uh, studied biology and botany in great detail and I enjoy including that in my fantasy works as well as in writing um, tabletop gaming guides. Hello everyone, I'm Thiago Ambrosio Lage. I'm uh, speaking from Brazil. I'm a food engineer and professor. My PhD was in biotechnology. I studied East and I write um, science fiction and fantasy. Uh, hi, thanks. Uh, I'm also in uh, Chicago, and I also didn't make my bed. So um, yeah, the, apologies for that. Um, I'm a science fiction writer. People may have seen my books like Quantum Magician or House of Sticks. Uh, I have a, a master's degree as well in molecular biology. And so, you know, I'm really into using that for world building. And um, I like some uh, fantasy worlds where they take some scientific sensibilities and stuff. And so that's that's something I do with when I'm writing fantasy as well. So really excited to be here and to chat with you guys. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm really honored to have such a, uh, such a scarily educated group of people with me. I don't have a degree in anything related to biology, uh, but, uh, but I'm Dan Benson. I, uh, and I, I've written uh, a couple of books about uh, aliens Dan, you uh, talk like you're blaming us. You brought this terrible question. This is like, oh my God. I was like, this is going to be so easy. And then the first question, I'm like, oh my God, I don't know anything about anything the size of a horse. I do bacteria. 
in a in a bacteria centaur, the lower half is bacteria, and the upper half is a torso. <laughs> How do bacteria breathe? So in a bacteria, <laughs> a bacteria sized centaur would be a lot easier because, you know, you could just have straight diffusion in and out and the little flagella running would look really cute. Well, that would be adorable. <laughs> uh, I, I wish I could draw to, to, to draw these bacteria. Uh, what we could do is if anybody in the chat is is watching now and it's possible to upload a photo, if you can draw a little uh, paramecium um, centaur and then upload it into the chat, that'd be cool. Or just yes. tweet it out if you can. When do you decide to stop using science? Absolutely. So um, a good example is in my um, novel, Love of the Sea. One of the magical elements of it is how mermaids um, are able to use magic. That um, I have a creation story in the prologue of that novel that kind of talks about why they have access to magic and humans don't. And the big thing is they channel their magic through um, what they call their found object, which is, it's literally that. It's an object that they find and they decide that it's their special object. And for the main character, Azrae, it's a gold comb. And as their magical wellspring grows, um, the object changes. So there's this point in the story where her magic reaches like a new, you know, for lack of a better word, level, and um, diamonds grow on the comb magically. And there's no scientific explanation. You can't just magically grow gemstones on a gold comb. That's not how things work. But, you know, magic, we just, it just is. Ta-da! <laughs> you know? So it's, it's things like that where it's, you know, okay, we're going to have these very high fantasy, high magic elements in the story and it's okay that it has no scientific explanation because it's just magic but i always make sure to ask myself i'm not just saying magic in order to just fix a plot hole or fix an explanation yeah. it has to be purely right. this is magic not just i don't know <laughs> <laughs> right because that can become too convenient Hello everyone, I am Lauren A.R. Masterson, aka Alice Liddell. Some of y'all probably know me better as KHR Arts on Twitch. I am looking fabulous today because I am on site at Con and I have been the mermaid queen all day today. I did take off a bit of my accoutrement because I am sitting in a chair. <laughs> but yeah, I have been live streaming on Twitch for two years now. Um, my whole vibe is cozy, safe space, LGBTQ friendly, just super chill, super fun. We're going to have a good day stream. Yeah, so when I started on my Twitch live streaming journey, um, I actually started off with doing um, live drawing where I did um, live streams where I would um, do the line art for a digital illustration that I had, you know, taken the time previously to sit there and draw it and all that. And then um, on the live stream, I would then uh, do like the full fleshed out piece. You know, I would do all of the coloring and the shading and all of that while telling people stories about stuff. Um, so like stories from my childhood, stuff about, you know, what I did that day, you know, just kind of having, you know, a little chit chat sort of session with everybody. And then um, my viewers started being like, hey, this is great and all. And, you know, we love your art, but um, could you play this video game? Could you play this video game? <laughs> and so I was like, okay. And, you know, I gave the people what they wanted and I started playing video games on stream and I started, you know, drawing less and less. And now my main thing is I stream Minecraft and every once in a while I'll stream um, other video games, but Minecraft is definitely the main thing and everybody seems to love it. Uh, so yeah, it's sometimes what you start out doing is not necessarily going to be like your thing that you're going to become known for and that it's important to allow yourself to have that kind of evolution and to be open to that change because you never know, you know, what might take off, what people really might enjoy, but it's also important to make sure that it's still authentic to you, that you're not trying to be somebody that you're not, that you're not 
um, you know, doing some sort of interest that doesn't actually interest you. It's simply popular, you know, make sure it does have to do with you and your branding, because I do personally like playing Minecraft. I just didn't think people wanted to watch me wrangle 8 million animals and build bridges all day, but apparently they do. <laughs> so here we are. Hello everyone, I am Lauren A.R. Masterson, aka Alice Liddell. I am live from Chicon, and I am an author, artist, and live streamer. I am a part of the LGBTQ community, so I run in a lot of circles, I manage a lot of handles, I've got a lot of experience, and I can't wait to get started with y'all. Why, why should writers spend their time creating an online presence? Is it something that's just going to, is it something that's going to be valuable or is it something that's going to be a drag from your time? And we'll start this one with Lauren. So unfortunately it is a little bit of both. Um, I will admit that managing, um, even if I were to take everything else that I do out of the equation and only, you know, the time that I spend with all of my author stuff, um, it is a bit of a time suck having to do all of my social media and marketing and all that. Um, but that's kind of just the nature of the industry. And it's just the age that we live in, in that you really have to pump that time and energy into your marketing strategy in order to get yourself seen as an author, because especially with the advent of um, true self-publishing today, there's just a sea of voices out there and everyone is trying to yell the loudest and you have to come up with um, more creative ways to help yourself be seen. So it's, it's kind of a necessary evil at this point. Doing the panels was certainly more intensive than working the booth. The booth was pretty much, it was long hours. It was typically from about 9 a.m. to 6 or 6.30 p.m. So those were long hours of a lot of sitting, a lot of standing, and a lot of talking. But the panels were very intense in that even though they were each only about an hour long, there was a lot of to and fro with that, and there was a lot of mental preparation that went into that. So... I had to juggle doing both the in-person panels and the virtual panels. This meant that I had to juggle jumping between doing panels that were at the actual hotel and going up to our hotel room and I had my whole computer rig with me and doing what is essentially the same thing as my weekend live streams where I logged on to their official live streaming service and I did the panels with the other panelists who some of them were also at the con, others were off-site as they were not able to attend the con in person. And the fact that I was able to speak alongside people from such places as Japan, Brazil, and even the Ukraine was amazing and just really showcased how worldwide this convention was. So it was a lot of effort on my part juggling these different panels and keeping track of which ones were on site and which ones were virtual. And with the on site ones, the Hyatt Regency in the loop is a huge hotel and it has two towers, the East Tower and the West Tower. And so you had to not only juggle which tower your panel was in, but also which floor it was on. And sometimes the maps were confusing to read and there was just a lot of scrambling around making sure <laughs> that I was in the place that I needed to be in. Thankfully, I only missed one panel, which I think is incredible, all things considered. 
and that was on my first day of the convention and a big part of that was just the timing of everything. Our hotel room wasn't ready yet so I had to do my first virtual panel in one of the conference rooms at the convention and they only let you check in for an hour's time otherwise then you have to go all the way to the opposite side of the hotel to recheck in for another hour and unfortunately that panel ran late and on top of it there was no time for me to run all the way across to check in for another hour and then go back to whatever conference room they assigned me to and on top of it our hotel room was finally ready so i wanted to get set up in our hotel room and by the time that we got all of that figured out I only had 10 minutes left in the panel, and technically it wasn't a panel, it was a virtual reading, which meant that it only affected me and the people who had wanted to show up to my reading. I was not impacting other panelists. I am absolutely impressed that I only missed one panel considering that I was a part of 10 panels for the weekend, and as well as juggling in-person and virtual panels. It was a lot, y'all. It was exhausting. It was very stressful. But again, I'm really grateful that I had the experience and I learned a lot. And <laughs> of course, one of the biggest and most obvious lessons was I am never doing that ever again. I am never doing that many panels at a convention ever again. I am going to definitely be far more judicious in which panels I decide to be a part of just for my own personal health and sanity. And that was another big lesson that I learned at this convention. One of the big conclusions that Neil and I came to after doing Worldcon was that we are just not ready to do a convention of this magnitude quite yet. What that means is that between the two of us, it was still so much work and it was so incredibly stressful in order to do a massive five-day event like this. And neither of us could even imagine what it would have been like if all 11,000 people had showed up at this convention. I'm not sure we would have been able to handle that. So going forward, we're definitely going to stick with more of the mid-size local conventions that we're used to going to and maybe exploring some other local mid-sized events and conventions. But for now, the big leagues like Worldcon and DragonCon and GenCon are things that are going to be in the future. They're not things that we're going to be exploring at the moment because we're just not prepared for that caliber as of yet. And one of the biggest things that we found that we really needed in order to be able to tackle something like that is we have to get to the point where we can afford to hire somebody to be our assistant to do something like that because it is just such an incredible amount of work, y'all. And on top of it, having to essentially be in three different places at the same time with working as a vendor and a panelist and trying to network, it's just too much to expect of anybody. The next big thing that I learned from this convention is something that I have been coming to terms with since December of 2020 is that I am more disabled than I previously believed myself to be. Now, I do want to clarify this is not an issue of pride or delusion or any of that. It is the simple fact that I have been so used to my entire life being a very independent person and being the kind of person who just pushes through, even if that means pushing through pain or pushing through mental distress. That's just the kind of person I am. It doesn't make it okay or healthy to do but it is the way that I have lived my life in the past. And this convention really showed me that I am not physically capable of doing that anymore. And it was scary and it was embarrassing to have to realize that, that there were days where my body hurt so much that it did impact my ability to function at the convention. And we only went to parties the first two evenings of the convention, which honestly was probably for the best, especially because later on in the convention, there were some people who tested positive for COVID, and thank goodness, Neil and I tested negative when we came home, so we did not catch the COVID, which was awesome that we were able to escape that. But that's not the reason why we didn't go to parties the last two days of the convention. The reason was because I physically couldn't walk. And facing that kind of disability was really hard. Again, I'm used to 
pushing through, forcing myself through pain and through distress to be able to get the job done. And the fact that I could not physically do that, that my body refused to cooperate, was unsettling and was a new experience for me that I did not enjoy. But it was a learning experience. I learned a lot from it. I have learned a lot about my limitations and I am going to continue to learn my limitations and learn what I need to do in order to deal with those limitations and how I can better function and handle myself at future events and conventions so that I do not get to the physical point of literally breaking where I can't even physically walk. Now I know what some of you are thinking is, well, why were you wearing such elaborate costumes each day? Isn't that probably why you physically broke down like that? And the answer is yes and no. Is chances are I would have broken down to some degree regardless of what I was wearing. And that's because I suffer from severe joint problems, including hip dysplasia. So it's a matter of wear and tear that if I am stomping around on concrete floors and standing all day and just running around for hours and hours and hours, at one point, my hips are just going to literally give up. It's just a matter of running out the clock is really all it is. And it doesn't matter if I'm wearing tennis shoes or I'm wearing high heels, my hips are just going to give up. And then on top of it, with the joint problems that I have, specifically I have arthritis in my hands and my wrists, and I have severe issues with my shoulders and that I have had over 50 shoulder injuries over the course of my life, specifically dislocations. So yeah, just <laughs> spending a lot of the convention being in physical pain, just from the stress of doing load in and, and setting up the booth and just the general wear and tear of running around and handling the booth all day, each day. It just physically wore on me and it was a lot. And I thought that I was prepared because I did bring some things that do help me with these ailments. However, something to this magnitude, these sorts of things that were wrong with me, it was just a band-aid that helped for a few hours is really all it did. So just going forward with conventions, I'm going to be a lot more careful protecting my physical health and I'm going to be more realistic on what I am capable of doing and what I need to do in order to be more functional without hurting myself. Lastly, of course, is the opposite of the stress of load in is stress of load out, which is where you do what you did for load in, except in reverse. So you break down the booth, you get everything packed up, and then you drag everything out of the dealer's hall and put it all back in your car. Thankfully, because we had packed everything in suitcases and because the loading dock was an absolute madhouse, we did get away with, they did actually let us do the quote unquote hand carry loadout on the last day, which really did help with my stress that we didn't have to worry about that. So we ended up doing it where we carried everything out of the dealer's hall up into the hotel lobby where I stood and waited with our things while Neil carried everything up. And then Neil waited with all of our things while then I went down to the valet to get the Jeep. And then I had the adventure of having to figure out how to get out of Lower Wacker, get back up onto Upper Wacker, and be able to get to the hotel lobby, which was a whole adventure, y'all, because as some of y'all know, I am directionally challenged. I have dyscalculus, and directions are not my forte, and as those of y'all who live in Chicago know, there is no GPS reception in Lower Wacker, so yeah, I got fantastically lost, ended up on the highway, had a good scream and cry, to be perfectly honest, and then I made my way back to the hotel. And by the time I arrived, poor Neil was already <laughs> being scrutinized by security who was wondering what on earth he was doing with seven suitcases and all kinds of crazy nonsense in the hotel lobby. And thankfully we were able to load out from there fairly quickly, getting everything packed up in the car, and we were able to finally head back home. We were both incredibly exhausted at that point. We stopped for some carryout on the way home from Taco Bell and ate in the parking lot just so that we could just have a minute to decompress before we brought everything back to my place and unloaded everything 
and then he was able to load up his stuff in his car and head back to his place. And just all of this choreography is just so much, regardless of the size of the convention. It's basically everything that I listed in this video is just put it on either a larger or smaller scale, depending on the convention, but all of the steps are essentially the same for every convention. And regardless, it's always stressful and it's always a lot. But some conventions are easier to deal with than others. A big part of post-convention is balancing getting my work back on track as well as resting to get my body and my mind back on track. And balancing that out is a huge challenge for me, something that I am still working on even today with trying to keep that balance of moving myself forward while making sure that I am taking time to rest both my body and my mind. So I spent a lot of this past week sleeping. Not gonna lie, I spent a lot of time sleeping, which of course frustrates me because to me that still is something my mind perceives as wasted time. Something I'm still unlearning, we're working on it. But I did also spend a lot of time working on all of my post-convention work. What is post-convention work? It's, as I've shown, <laughs> with doing 800 loads of laundry, doing all of the laundry from the con, especially because I bring all of those costumes, as I said, that's a lot of laundry I have to do. And then that's a lot of laundry I have to put away, a lot of accessories and shoes and things that I have to put away where they go. And yes, I do actually take the time and effort to make sure I put everything back where it goes because I do a lot of photo shoots and events and things, so it's important for me to know where everything is at all times so that it's easy for me to be able to pack for whatever the next big event or photo shoot or whatever is. Another big part of the post-convention work is doing book inventory again and going over my expenses and my sales, doing all that fun information for taxes later on, getting all of my Excel documents in order, all of that very tedious stuff. And then of course doing stuff like this, which is the post-convention posts on social media, videos talking about it, connecting with the people that I networked with after the convention, going over business cards and sending out emails to different people, just all of that. It takes a lot of time and a lot of mental effort to get all of that done, and it did take me the full week in order to complete all of those post-convention tasks. It is finally the week after the post-convention week, and I am just now starting to get on with my catch-up work and getting back onto my business-as-usual schedule. Now, the difference between my business-as-usual schedule and my catch-up work means that my catch-up work is all the stuff that I essentially had to put on hold during the convention that normally would have been completed during the time of the convention that I had to then make sure that I completed ASAP after the convention. And it was just yesterday that I completed the last of my catch-up work for the convention, and now I'm starting to get back into the business as usual with all of my tasks. And again, a lot of this is a lot of stress with coordinating and just making sure that I'm prioritizing tasks and getting things done in a timely manner, getting things done in time for deadlines, just all of the above. It's a lot to orchestrate, and on top of it, when you know that you have to also take extra time to rest and sleep, it can be frustrating, but I have made it work, and I think that I hit a really good rhythm with it, despite the fact that it took far longer than I would have liked. But this is the new me. <laughs> this is the new present of actually taking care of myself, so things take longer than they used to for me. Going forward, Neil and I will be attending the Haymond, Indiana Public Library Fan Fest. This is the absolute opposite of Worldcon in that it is a much smaller event. It's only one day and it's a, an adorable little event at this library. I do it every year. I love supporting local libraries. And yeah, it's just really cute. There's a lot of really wonderful people there, and it's an event that I don't expect to do a ton of sales at, but being able to network with libraries and the people that go to those libraries is very important, and it's something you should prioritize as an author. 
After that, we will be being a part of one of our favorite conventions, WindyCon, so that will be really fun. That's one of the mid-size local conventions that will be during a weekend. So it's a multi-day event in November. It's definitely not five days, <laughs> but it is long enough, which means that, again, we have to do all of the coordinating with load in and load out and hotel and all of that funness. But it is definitely a much smaller scale than something like Worldcon, which means it'll be far more manageable. However, of course, that means we can't be complacent and still make sure that we do all of our due diligence with preparation so that it can go as smoothly and the least amount of stress as possible. As many people asked me at the convention, as well as many people who asked me on social media, I will say it again here. I am currently working on my next romance novel titled Be Mine. I'd say it is about three fourths of the way done for the rough draft, and then I will be moving into editing. I am also currently querying my sixth novel, the dark fantasy vampire novel, Succumb to Darkness. So fingers crossed, I'm hoping to get that published and out in the world ASAP. And after that, I will be moving on to finishing book one of my YA fantasy book series, as well as doing the illustrations for it. And then close on the heels of that will be my next novella titled Pumpkin Gin. So I hope y'all will stay tuned and enjoy all of these projects that I have lined up for y'all. Hopefully some of them out by the end of this year, if not early in next year. So I hope y'all like this video. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you like this video, please be sure to give it a like. And if you're new, subscribe. All right, everyone. Thank y'all so much. Take care. Bye-bye.